So today we're going to be looking at some of the rational treatments of cancer that have arisen since the molecular understanding of cancer have improved. So when we look at the cancer research, or if we look back at the, the, this series of videos that I've been presenting to you, we've been looking at some of the advancements that's been made in documenting the molecular biology of cancer. So we've talked about um, this idea of a multi-hit hypothesis. So there's within a particular cell, over time, there are multiple genetic events that knock out multiple genes or that affect multiple genes. And then that this gives the cell a growth advantage. And we've talked about some of the um, gene types within the cell. So we've talked about oncogenes. Um, oncogenes are proteins which in normal biology drive a cellular process. And in cancer biology, these genes or these proteins are hyperactivated. And when they're hyperactivated, they push the growth signal um, beyond what, 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 what it would normally be. We've talked about um, tumor suppressors. So tumor suppressors are proteins in the cell that slow down growth. And when you knock out the tumor suppressors, then you um, lose the ability to slow down growth, which is the same as driving growth. Okay, and we talked about the analogy whereby the oncogenes can be thought of as a, um, an accelerator in a car and the tumor suppressors can be thought of as being the brake in the car. And if you make the accelerator more sensitive through a hi hi hyperactive protein, then you drive growth. If you take the brakes and you knock out the brakes, then effectively you can't stop the growth. Okay, so we talked about these types of proteins. Um, we've also talked a little bit about cell cycle regulation. So, um, and we've talked a little bit, little bit about signaling pathways. And together, we, we have um, signaling pathways which feed into controlling cell growth. And within these signaling pathways, we have these oncogenes and tumor suppressor proteins. And in cancers, multiple um, components of these signaling pathways over time are knocked out. Um, just one more comment I'd like to make before I move on to the next slide. When you're considering oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, with the oncogenes, you you, you can have a mutation in only one of the alleles. So we have two alleles for every gene. Only one allele needs to be mutated if it's a hyperactive mutation because the mutant allele is dominant over the recessive allele. So you've created a mutation in one copy which dominates. With the tumor suppressors, because it's a loss of function, you need to lose both copies of the gene, so you need to knock out both alleles. And we talked about this process of loss of heterozygosity in a previous lecture. And it's important to realize that there's a clear genetic distinction between the oncogenes and the tumor suppressors. And that distinction is, for the oncogenes, you can have a mutation in one allele that can lead to a cancer phenotype. Whereas with tumor suppressor um, genes, you need to knock out both copies before you see the phenotype. Because if you knock out one tumor suppressor, you still have a good tumor suppressor, because we've got two alleles. So with one good tumor suppressor, you can still suppress growth. Whereas with one hyperactive allele, it will dominate over the normal allele. Okay, so be clear that there's a genetic difference between the oncogenes and the tumor suppressors. Anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. Let's carry on. So when we look at the, um, the, the history, if you like, of cancer treatment, even today, a lot of the cancer treatments that are used in the clinic um, come from an earlier period. So in the mid-70s, some cancer treatments were developed and these are still very popular and 
used within the, the clinic. Okay, and what, what you have to understand is that in the mid 1970s, we didn't have you know this high throughput sequencing technology that we have these days. We we knew a lot less about biology, but we're still able to develop a couple of techniques which have proven to be highly efficient. Okay, so um, so despite all of this understanding of these processes that we've been talking about in this lecture series, still a lot of the cancer treatments we use today come from an earlier time. And we still have difficulty preventing the onset of cancer, and we still have difficulty treating um, cancers. Now, there has been some progress in this field, and that's what we're going to talk about during this series of lectures. Um, I've just put this slide together to talk about the, you know, the, the mid-1970s approach to cancer drug development. And this is in stark contrast to what we're going to be talking about when we look at rational drug design in a few videos' time. So what I'm trying to show here is there's a guy here, his name is, I think it's Barnett Rosenberg. And he was um, in the, I think, late 1960s, he was studying would you believe the effect of electric fields on E. coli? So what he was doing, and bear with me, uh, this will come round to talking about an anti-cancer drug, but he was studying the um, effect of electric fields on E. coli growth. So he got a, um, an electrophoresis tank with some salts that would conduct the electricity, and he ran electric current from one end to the other, in the same way that you would do if you were running um, an electrophoresis experiment where you were, had some agarose and you were running DNA through the agarose in a tank. He was doing that, but without a tank, he was just using the buffer and putting E. coli in the solution with these platinum inner electrodes and running ele electricity through the system and seeing how it affected bacteria. And what he noticed is that these individual rod bacterias were growing as these long chains. So the effect of the electricity was causing these long chains um, in, in the bacteria phenotype. So cells weren't able to divide. They were just sort of becoming elongated. As, you know. And once he investigated what was going on, now remember during electrophoresis we have platinum electrodes okay, in a salt solution. So what was happening at the platinum electrodes, the, the, there was a reaction happening with the salts in the buffers to make this compound here. And this compound here is called cisplatin. Okay, so inadvertently he was making cisplatin in his experiment to study electricity effects on bacteria. And the cisplatin was causing, um, was stopping these cells from dividing properly. So people thought, well, this compound is really interesting, let's study it in other contexts. So let's have a look at what cisplatin does on cancers, because it's affecting the growth of these bacteria, so maybe it will affect the growth of tumours. So um, there's a diagram here showing a bit of double-stranded DNA helix, and this is showing the cisplatin. So this molecule here, the red bit's the platinum, this platinum is bound and constricting and affecting DNA metabolism. And if you can't metabolize your DNA properly, you can't replicate, you can't express genes, then this was the, the outcome. And it turns out when you treat tumors with cisplatin, the cisplatin stops the growth of the tumor cells very efficiently. Okay. It also affects normal cells because it's not specific, but it particularly affects fast-growing cells. So it affects the cancer cells more. And what we have here over a couple of decades of research was the development of an anti-cancer drug being cisplatin, which was um, they started to use that in the clinic in the mid-1970s. And to this day, cisplatin is still one of the most highly used anti-cancer drugs for a range of different cancers. Okay, so this is, if you like, a serendipitous discovery 
of an anti-cancer drug. Whereas you can't rely on these chance findings to develop drugs against such a, a range of cancers. You need to have a much more applied approach. So we have this idea of rational drug design. Take what we know about cell biology and affect signaling pathways to stop cells from growing. Okay, so that's a little bit of a discourse just to say that we know an awful lot about cell biology. Before we knew about cell biology, drug discovery was this serendipitous procedure. Now that we know about cell biology, we can start to um, design drugs for um, cancers. But before we get into looking at rational drug design, let's just have a look at some of the progress that's been made towards a couple of, a couple of cancer types over the past couple of decades. So if we look at the statistics of lung cancer survival over um, from, from the 1970s and more recently, um, it, it used to be a case that 7% of people diagnosed with lung cancer would still survive after five years. So 7% were surviving over five years. Whereas more recently, we, we've got about double that. We've got about 14% surviving after five years. So wonderful, that's really good, but it's not a case that what we know about lung cancer has led to the improvement of of the, the, the fighting the cancer. What it, I think basically this statistic is a little misleading because we're detecting lung cancer earlier so because you would detect it earlier then the survival rate is longer. It doesn't mean that we've made any real progress in treating the disease. So these kind of statistics maybe don't really show an improvement in the treatment of the cancer. Okay, so let's consider um, colon cancer. So death rates to, um, attributed to colon cancer have begun to fall. Um, again, it's not because we can treat the cause of colon cancer in those cells. The reason um, people are surviving more is that we have these mechanisms to detect colon cancer. We have colonoscopies, we have colon kits that are sent out to people who are 50 years old to start taking some you know, samples and send them off to hospitals to try and detect colon cancer in its early stages. And we know from the lectures that um, through the um, succession of phenotypes, the, um, the development of, of, the, of the colon cancer, if you can cut it out early, you, you stop the development of those cells into full-blown cancer. So, you know, it, it's one of these cancers that can be detected early and can be surgically removed quite easily. So, little has changed about, um, you know, treating these cancers with drugs, but if you detect them and remove them, then that clearly leads to a better outcome, which is important. But when you look at a whole bunch of other cancers, they're difficult to detect early on, and when you do detect them, they're in their late stages, and it's very, very difficult to treat late-stage cancers. So once they've become malignant and have metastasized and moved around the body, then it's very difficult to treat them. So, again, this is looking at some statistics for um, a bunch of cancers that you know, the um, mortality has declined for these cancers. So for stomach cancer and, you know, a, a couple of other cancers listed here, there has been a decline in, in the, the, um, the mortality over time. But these changes are because of changes to like food storage practice and you know, the discovery of bacteria like Helicobacter pylori, the discovery of bacteria that are involved in causing stomach ulcers and leading on to stomach cancer. And through improved um, hygiene and storage, that's led to decreases in these cancers. But again, you know, you could argue that our understanding of 
you look back to pylori, you know, life cycles and how it interacts with the body is a bit of, is based on molecular, but a lot of these changes are, are just due to behavioral changes to um, food hygiene. Okay, which is good, but again, we want to be able to um, treat cancers that are developing in the body.